surface-to-air missile systems were the mainstay of Soviet air defenses. This video will explain both the underlying principles of how they work and the history of their first system, which was ahead of its time in many ways. The video is scripted and animated by our guest author Balaj Molnar. Take it from here, Molni Balaj. The evolution of the Soviet Russian surface to air missile systems from their beginnings until this day is a huge and complex topic. The goal of this video is to explain the airborne threats and the missile systems which were initially developed against them. Through the evaluation of Russian SAMs, the features and limitations of air defense systems in general will be explored. The diagram summarizes the history of the Soviet Russian homeland surface to air missile systems from their introduction to the end of manufacturing, export and service. To understand the capabilities and limitations of SAM systems, at least the minimal physics and technical background of SAM systems has to be explained. Every homeland air defense system is designed to operate a radar for target tracking. Radars generally emit radio waves in a cone-shaped area, regardless of their operational frequency or wavelength, waveform and antenna types. This is called the main lobe. Antennas also produce side lobes and even back lobes, but these will be discussed later. For easier explanation of the basis of radar, let's replace the radar with a flashlight. A flashlight produces a beam visible in the light spectrum, but not in radio spectrum. Depending on the size and type of the flashlight, it can have different beam width and different power levels. The beam can be symmetric or asymmetric. For easier explanation, let's just consider a symmetric beam, which has a conical shape. The cone has a central angle, which defines the width of the beam. If we wish to see farther at night, using the same power output, the light has to be focused on a smaller area. This creates a narrower beam and the power density of the beam is higher, even though the emitted power is the same. The illuminated area becomes smaller in exchange for a longer detection range. Translating that into the world of radars, when the frequency and emitted power are the same, a narrower lobe is required for longer detection range. A narrower beam can be produced by using a larger antenna. If the antenna size cannot be increased, for example because of mobility requirements, but larger detection range is required, the emitted power has to be increased. Using the flashlight analogy, this means a more powerful light source is needed. Of course, certain size flashlights cannot enjoy infinitely large power levels because of the law of thermodynamics and practical limits in electronics. Translating that into the world of radars, more power means a heavier antenna, more powerful and more expensive electronics, and more cooling is required if the lobe and antenna size remain the same. The size of the antenna also depends on the used frequency, or wavelength. Considering the same lobe width for a lower frequency, meaning higher wavelength, a radar with a larger antenna is needed. The longer wavelength incurs less accurate distance and angle measurements, but it provides longer detection range. Because of this, target acquisition radars, meaning early warning radars, use mostly the symmetric 3 GHz or metric 0.3 GHz wavelengths. Fire control radars use wavelengths measured in centimeters because of missile guidance requirements. Because the emitted lobe needs to cover a lot of airspace, especially in case of a target acquisition radar, the lobe has to be steered. This can be done mechanically, rotating or tilting the antenna, or electronically, or using both methods. These are the cornerstones of the antenna and radar design, but there are many other factors. For understanding the capabilities of SAM systems, the following factors will be presented and explained during the video the threat types of the era, meaning targets, radar type, target and missile channels, guidance type and missile leading, engagement zone, properties and kinematics of the missiles, missile quantity and reload time, relocation capability, and operational and maintenance issues. Let's go back to the original topic. The first successfully developed guided missile system of the Soviet Union was the S-25 Berkut which was called SA-1 Guild in the NATO. The system got its name from one of the lead designers, which were Sergei Alberia and Pavel N. Kukshenko. Sergei was the son of an infamous leader of the KGB. Following Stalin's death and fall of the KGB leader Beria, his name was inconvenient, therefore the later variant of the S-25 
was renamed after the river Sosna. This tradition lived on for a long time in the consideration of naming homeland air defense systems. Even though the name was changed, this video uses the name Berkut, because it is more widely known than Sosna. The development of the system was induced by the lessons of the strategic bombing of World War II, especially the two nuclear bomb attacks against Japanese cities. The Soviet designers came to the same conclusion as the engineers in the US. Because of the limitations of air defense guns against faster and higher flying bombers, it was not possible to defend cities using guns with desired efficiency within reasonable costs. Even a single penetrating bomber with a nuclear or later thermonuclear bomb could deal massive damage to any target. The goal of the S-25 system was defending Moscow against bombers of the US Strategic Air Command, the B-36, B-47 and the B-52. The S-25 Berkut missile sites were built around Moscow. They formed two concentric defense rings which protected the capital with equal efficiency in every direction against the US strategic bombers, not only from the polar routes from the US. The outer ring was positioned about 85 to 90 kilometers, or 55 miles, from the city, while the inner ring was set up at 45 to 50 kilometers, or 30 miles. Each SAM site was made out of a single missile regiment. The outer ring consisted of 34 regiments and the inner ring of 22 regiments. They were assigned to four different SAM division corps, the 10th, 6th, 1st and 17th. Besides these missile batteries, A100 long-range target acquisition or early warning radars were also installed around Moscow to provide timely information about the attackers. These radars provided target coordinates to ground-controlled fighter interceptions, in addition to providing warning to S-25 missile sites. To get full coverage, 10 A-100 radars were installed around 400 kilometers, or 250 miles, from Moscow, and four more A-100 radars were installed close to Moscow. The A-100 radars had a nominal detection range against bombers of around 200 kilometers, or 124 miles. It is important to understand the role of the S-25 Berkut system. It was only the last line of the defense around Moscow, but it was not the only tool meant to stop the bombers of the US Strategic Air Command and the British bombers. This remark is true for every SAM system in every era, and it is still true even today. Nobody expected that the ground-based air defense alone could stop the incoming bombers. Let's take a look at the typical S-25 site. A single S-25 Berkut site had 60 missiles in ready-to-launch state. The missiles were stored in vertical position in case of alert. The launch stations were connected via roads so the reloader trucks could reload the empty launch positions or pick up missiles and transport them to maintenance depots or any other locations. Small bunkers were constructed close to the missiles, used for launch preparation and other tasks one such bunker per every six missiles. The core of the S-25 Berkut site is the control bunker with the electronic components, the B-200 Yo-Yo fire control radar system and the guidance command antennas. They were all placed some distance away from the missile launchers. The S-25 batteries were not all 100% identical, but the basic layout of the sites was similar. The sites could launch missiles only in directions outward of Moscow due to the design of the Yo-Yo antenna system. Once the target reached the minimal engagement range of the outer ring, only the inner ring could launch missiles once the target reached its zone. Because of the basic working principle and the design of the Yo-Yo fire control radar system, every missile site had a static engagement zone. The Yo-Yo antenna system consisted of two antenna structures, each with two antenna sets. Each rotating antenna set had three antennas. These antennas were positioned at a 120 degree circular offset. Each antenna set was rotated. One antenna structure, with its two antenna sets, scanned in azimuth, meaning left to right, the other in elevation, meaning down to up. Each antenna or emitter produced a 1 degree by 60 degrees lobe. The rotation of the antenna sets created a spherical shell scan zone.
The rotation speed of the antenna sets was 50 rotations per minute. The combination of rotation speed and the antenna design yielded 300 scans per minute in a 60 by 60 degrees area. This provided the targeting data for missile guidance. The YoYo was the first track while scan or TWS capable radar system in the world. The large and heavy antenna system made it possible to have such a high scan rate in a large airspace. For comparison, the fire control radars of the following system, the SA-75 Dvina, which was called SA-2A guideline by NATO, scanned only a 10 by 10 degree area with a similar scan rate, and the later S-75M Volco, NATO code SA-2E, scanned an area of only 7 by 7 degrees in size. Why was such a high scan rate needed? The S-25 Berkut was the first SAM system in the world which had multiple target channels per site. More exactly, it had 20 target channels per site. It could engage 20 targets simultaneously per site, each with a single missile. Every target and guided missile had to be tracked with a high refresh rate for accurate missile guidance. To meet that requirement, a very large and heavy yo-yo radar system was needed. It has to be underlined that the 20 target channels capability was achieved by brute force method and not by using elegant technical solutions. Because many target channels were required, the electronics needed to be large and heavy, which also required a large bunker to house them. For comparison, the later designed S300PS, NATO code SA-10B, had 6 target channels and 12 missile channels, yet the whole system needed only some cabins installed on self-propelled vehicles, and only two radars for the whole missile battery, all of which were mobile components on vehicles. The brute force approach had a large impact both on the size and cost of the elements for the Berkut system. The development and deployment were a heavy burden on the economics of the Soviet Union in the post-World War II era. The road network of the Berkut system around Moscow was about 1000 kilometers or 600 miles long. The hardened bunkers and other building costs were about half of the total cost. The missiles represented about a quarter of the total cost. The remaining quarter of the costs were spent on radars and electronics. The missiles used radio control guidance. The YoYo radar system tracked both targets and Berkut's own missiles. Using the data gathered by the YoYo radar system, target and missile coordinates were calculated. Processed guidance commands were calculated and emitted to the missiles in flight from the antennas in front of the bunker. These guidance commands adjusted the trajectory of the missiles. The missile itself is blind and just flies in the direction commanded from the brain system on the ground. This brain system is the bunker with the yo-yo radar, known as the guidance station. The missile was a single stage design. The very toxic two component liquid fuel it used required maintenance and fueling of the missiles to be performed in full chemical protection suits only. This made it difficult to work with the missiles. The dangerous fuel was selected because it was necessary to achieve the desired range. The liquid fuel of that time had much better energy density or specific impulse compared to solid fuels. The missiles in their ready-to-launch state were placed vertically. Following the launch, the YoYo radar started to track the missiles at the altitude of a few hundred meters. Missiles received guidance commands, then started to turn towards the target. Initially, the smallest elevation scan angle of the YoYo antenna was 8 degrees. Only after 1965 and its S25M2 variant, a smaller scan angle was set. The distance between the farthest missile and the YoYo radar was about 1.6 kilometers or 1 mile, which means the missile got the first guidance command from the radar at an altitude of about 200 meters or 600 feet. The vertical position was demanded by the single-stage design. The thrust of the engines built up relatively slowly and the missile lacked large wings. The control surfaces on the missiles or stabilizers were effective only at supersonic speeds, so anything other than a vertical launch would have caused the missiles to crash following the launch. During the long service of the Berkut, the missiles used three different designation systems. For clarification, 
missile variants of all the used designations are displayed in the charts. The launch weight of the first Type 205 missile was about 3.5 tons, or 7,000 pounds. Following the upgrades, the last variant Type 219 reached about 4.1 tons, or 8,200 pounds. The weight increase was a result of the incremental upgrades of the missile in many areas. The first Type 205 missile was manufactured with four smaller rocket engines because it was not possible to design and manufacture a single large engine. For 207A type missiles, a single large engine was developed, but the fuel was still fed using compressed air and gas generators. A turbo pump was applied to the Type 217 missile, which further increased the kinematic range of the missile. It was designed to engage smaller, maneuverable targets, so a MiG-19 was set up to beat the bar. The thrust of the 217 MAM missile variant single engine design was eventually double of the thrust of the first Type 205. The 217 MA got a more advanced proximity fuse, which enabled lower minimal engagement altitude in combination with changes in the yo-yo radar system. Because the types of targets changed during the service of the S-25 system, its warhead also changed many times. The first 205 type missile was equipped with the E-600 type 234kg or 515 pound warhead, which contained 6300 fragments, each weighing 27 grams or 0.95 ounces. The explosive itself only weighed 64 kilograms or 141 pounds. This was useful against intercontinental bombers. 2,924 missiles of this type were made. The 207A type got the different V196 type warhead with 196 stacked multi-jet shaped charges. These charges were similar to what was used in armor penetration warheads. The idea was that the many small jets hit and damaged the targets. The warhead weight was 327 kilograms, or 720 pounds, of which the explosive filler weight was 221 kilograms, or 487 pounds. 9,467 missiles of this type were made. The 217M missile type had an E-280 type warhead weighing 280 kilograms, or 617 pounds, with 18,500 small fragments, each weighing 5 grams, or 0.18 ounces. The 217MA and MAM types had 390 kg or 860 pound warhead with 36,000 4.3 gram fragments. The shrapnel density was better against smaller targets, like the US AGM-69 short-range air-to-ground missile, which could be used in a semi-ballistic or low-level flight profile. The last 219 missile type had the 5ZH-97 warhead with 32,000 fragments weighing 3.3 grams or 0.11 ounces. Three of the missile types, 207T, 217T and one version of the 219, were equipped with nuclear warheads. The Type 207 featured a nuclear warhead weighing 380 kilograms, with a destructive yield of 10 kilotons. The Berkut system was designed against subsonic, literally non-maneuvering intercontinental bombers, which had impact on the kinematics of the missile. The maximum turning capability of the 205 missile was only 4G below the altitude of 15 km, or 50,000 feet. Between 15 and 20 km, or 50 to 65,000 feet, it was limited to 3G maneuvers, and from 20 to 25 km, or 65 to 82,000 feet, it was just 2Gs. The 217M type missile reached 14Gs maximum overload, while the 217MA and MAM could turn to about 9Gs. The maximum values achieved below altitude of 15 km were not applicable to the whole engagement zone. The increased maximum overload was needed because of the faster and much smaller targets like the Mach 2 capable US AGM 28 Hound and Mach 3 capable AGM 69 SRAM missiles. The AGM 28 was in service in large numbers between 1961 and 1977, and the AGM 69 was in service from 1973 to 1993, retired only after the end of the Cold War. 
Let's talk about engagement zone of the system. Take note that the engagement zone can't be easily defined because upgraded variants of the S25 system could use older missiles. This combination of the radar, electronics and missiles resulted in different engagement zones. Only major changes are explained considering some combinations of the system and missiles in the following. These demonstrate well the increased capability of the system. Thanks to those changes, the engagement zone of the system dramatically increased compared to the first variant of the S-25 family. The first variant of the S-25 with the 205 type missile had about 8 km minimal engagement distance and a 5 km minimal engagement altitude. The maximum engagement distance was 30 km while at altitudes of up to 20 km. The maximum target speed was 330 meters per second. The Berkut was not designed against low flying targets. In that era low altitude engagement was not a design requirement. The bombers of Strategic Air Command were expected to fly at altitudes of 10 km or even higher. With S-25 using the 207A type, the minimal engagement altitude decreased to 3 km. In 1962 came the S-25 M2 variant, with the 217 M type missile extending the engagement zone to 35 km in distance at altitudes of up to 25 km. And the minimum engagement altitude further decreased to 1.5 km, thanks to the lower elevation setting of the upgraded B-200 MR radar. In 1969, the S-25MA with 217MA type missiles further pushed the maximum altitude from 35 km up to distances of 43 km, with 1.5 km of minimum altitude. In 1979, the S-25MAM with 217MAM type missiles could be used against targets flying at altitudes of only 0.5 km, with similar engagement limits as 217MA. But considering the altitude of terrain following cruise missiles, this was inadequate. Above 43 km, the engine burned out and in the passive phase of the missile, the engagement zone of the missile was restricted. Usefulness of this zone was theoretical. The meaning of the engagement zone is not always an easily understood term. It describes the zone where the missile can hit a target with specific parameters. The most commonly used diagrams concern non-maneuvering subsonic targets in a non-jamming environment with about 98% success rate. The engagement zone means only that a missile can reach the vicinity of the target but it does not guarantee a certain hit. For example, if the target is performing a defensive turn, the missile will also perform a turn to have an interception point. If an evasive maneuver demands a higher overload turn than the missile can perform, the missile simply won't hit the target. In the diagram, the available overload or G-factor within the engagement zone is visible using the 217MA type missile. The maximum speed of the target also increased following the upgrades, but this does not mean that the engagement zone against higher target speed is the same as against subsonic targets. Generally, we can say that as the target speed increases, the area engagement zone of the SAMs decreases and the minimal engagement distance is higher. Another factor is the electronic jamming. Jamming can have an effect on guidance and leading the missile, which also has an effect on trajectory of the missile. The engagement zone shows the location of the interception point of the missile. This means the target has to be tracked at longer distance than the maximum engagement zone. Let's assume the target is a B-52 bomber flying at 1000 km an hour or 270 meters per second at 12 km altitude or 39,000 feet. If we assume 30 seconds of operator's work and consider the 45 second missile flight time to a location 30 km away, the tracking of the target must be started at a point at least 50 km away. The zone which shows the possible region regarding the target when the missile can be launched for a successful interception is the launch envelope or launch zone, but it is rarely used because it is not so practical. If we consider a smaller and faster target than B-52, for example the AGM-28 Hound Dog missile, we can understand why it was such a difficult target. To hit a 600 meter per second fast missile at a distance of 35 kilometers and flying at an altitude of 17 kilometers, the tracking distance had to be at least 75 kilometers, which is double the engagement distance. 
in addition to the speed, the radar cross-section of the target was likely smaller. This demanded an increase of power to the yo-yo radar, from 2 megawatts to 10 megawatts. In short, in 1954 the S-25 with 205 type missiles was good enough against non-jamming bombers. In 1957 the S-25M with 207A type missile with 207T nuclear capable warhead could be used against jamming targets thanks to the three point guidance method and the sheer power of the nuclear warhead. In 1965 the S-25M2 with a more powerful radar and 217M type missile with a range of 43 kilometers could down targets like the AGM-28 Hound Dog or the U-2 spy plane. Besides the design changes to the missiles, the peak impulse power of the Yo-Yo radar system was increased from 2 megawatts to 10 megawatts in 1965. Following the S-25 M2 variant, the radar provided some 70 kilometers of detection range against a MiG-19 sized target. In 1968, the S-25 MAM with 217 MAM missile got a different warhead with smaller shrapnel but with more shrapnel, likely based on Vietnam experience. In 1979, the 217MAM type missile got a better proximity fuse against targets with a smaller radar cross-section, about 0.3 square meters. In the last upgrade in 1982, the S25MR received the 219 type missile, which just slightly increased the engagement zone from 43 to 46 kilometers. We can see that the Berkut had some upgrade potential, but it eventually became obsolete because of the rapid technological development in the Cold War. Even though the Berkut was in many aspects outdated by the middle of the 70s, the system remained in service until early 1980s. It even got small upgrades in 1982, just two years before its retirement in 1984. In the mid-80s, the Berkut became totally obsolete because of the low-flying cruise missiles like the BGM-109 Tomahawk or the AGM-86 air-launched cruise missile. These were the main threats in the 80s which flew much below the minimal engagement altitude of the Berkut. The S-300 PT and PS, NATO designation SA-10A and B, replaced Berkut around Moscow from 1984 onwards. When the S-25 entered service, it was a very potent and capable SAM system against bombers because of its numerous target channels. But this was also its drawback. It was so expensive that it soon became obvious the Soviet Union could not afford to defend all of its major cities even with a downscaled variant of the system. The follow-on SAM systems had to be simpler, more flexible and deployable compared to the completely static Berkut. The S-25 was one of a kind and a very expensive SAM system. Many of its features and technological solutions were unique, so the later developed SAM systems did not follow the S-25 concept at all. But that is another story, perhaps for some other video. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.